What's going on, everybody? My name is Jeff Fuller, J. Fuller Interviews, J. Fuller Interviews on Instagram, the Facebook group, YouTube, and Twitter. You can certainly subscribe on YouTube, J. Fuller Interviews. And now the Backfire Podcast on Google uh, Podcasts as well as iTunes. I believe people's stories make our stories much better, less ignorant, and more impactful. And one with a great story is Mike Penberthy. Mike, how are you? Great. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, first of all, congratulations. Uh, you are a two-time world champion as a player and now as a coach. Talk to me what the last few days have been like. Well, lots of sleep uh, and lots of reacquainting myself with my family since I missed them so much. So, uh, But mostly just resting. I mean, the bubble was uh, extremely taxing. Uh, this, the schedule was definitely unique, and um, uh, the, there was a mental – mental battle being in there so it feels good to be done and i don't think it's sunk in yet that uh that i'm a world champ uh, again with the lakers now mike what did you do in the bubble in terms of what in terms of what way just for fun or for free time were you just watching netflix did you just walk around the hmm. halls was there yeah i mean to give you a little idea of what's going on in the bubble i mean there's um we're, we're stuck in a hotel so we live, we stay in the same room every day, every night. Uh, we had uh, we had a restaurant to go to. We had like a bar that we could go to, and then we had our team rooms. Um, we could walk around the the facility itself, which is about a mile and a half walk. We could ride bikes, I guess you could say. Um, but primarily, what you did was uh, you worked. I mean, we only had a, a small amount of time really in between games to prepare. And so we spent most of our time working. We had uh, we had golf as an as a an availability based on our schedule. So it wasn't like we had just free time and you could just go golf whenever. So you had to kind of plan it around the schedule. And um, you know, thankfully the Lakers were uh, open to that. We had to beat the bubble. Yeah, I um, mean that was the that was kind of the phrase we used. It wasn't just uh, you know you you're not just there without without considering just how it is to function in it. So thankfully, Rob Plink and Frank Vogel, they were open to do whatever you got to do to make this thing work and uh, be ready to go when it's time. Pretty amazing. And so I have to be honest, I did not uh, know of you very much until I read Jeff Perlman's book, Three Ring Circus, and he talked very favorably about you in that book. I just want to talk about when Jeff told you he was writing this book, what were your thoughts? Did you know of Jeff before? Well, I knew of Jeff as a writer, uh, and I knew of him just as an incredible researcher. So, you know, you, you, you never know when you, when you talk about books because the author can paint the picture how he wants to. So you have to be really careful. But because I'd seen him as such an in, intense researcher, I felt like, you know, what I was going to say was going to be reported, you know, in a way that was the way I said it. You know what I mean? So it was going to be reported the, the right way. The narrative wasn't going to be swung in a way that I thought was going to be negative. So um, just I just knew his uh, reputation as an intense reporter, and I was uh, looking forward to chatting with him because I thought his idea was uh, was unique, and I knew he was going to talk to tons of players and coaches. So uh, I thought it was going to be a great idea. I heard, I've heard nothing but great things about the book, so I'm, I'm set down actually to read it. Uh, I'm supposed to take off on a trip for – uh, a day and i'm gonna go i'm gonna go dive into it shouldn't take me long no it's really good it's very good and uh, the book talks about you coming out of master's college now master's university uh talk to me when you first saw your first basketball card <laughs> did you try to buy all those up and give them out as gifts at christmas or what, what was that like for you well they gave me, they gave me the cards thankfully those those companies allowed me to to sign them and then they gave me some of them so that was nice uh I didn't have to buy any of them, but yeah, it was a little surprising at first. I mean, when they when they call you and say, "Hey, we want you to sign ten thousand cards," your first thought is, "My hand's going to fall off." The second thought is, "I can't believe that I'm actually signing my name to something that somebody else would want." Now, I don't think too many people want that card, but uh, for my family and I, it's uh, it's always fun to see them, and uh, I do have all the cards that they made. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, and so it started well before the Mustangs, but you were number 33 at Masters. Why did you choose number 33? Larry Bird. There you Larry go. Bird. He was, but you he grew was up one of my in California. You grew up in California, so were you a Bird fan? 
No, I was a Laker fan, but I felt like Larry Bird was the best player that I could emulate. I mean, he was the closest thing uh, from a skill standpoint that I wanted to be like. I wanted to be able to make threes. I wanted to be able to make shots. Uh, I wanted to be an amazing passer that he was. I thought his basketball IQ is what set him apart in the NBA besides his skill set. So he was just somebody I thought was an amazing player. But I was a Laker fan. I was a Magic Johnson fan. Magic was why I wanted to be a point guard. Um, and then I actually lived in Chicago for, for two years, and I became a Jordan fan then because I was 14, and he was playing in those series against the Pistons where he didn't destroy uh, and knock down. And, and one of my good friends in high school had season tickets, so I went to a lot of Jordan games, and I became a, automatically become a Michael Jordan fan after you see him live. So we're the same age. I'm 45. You have been beat by a couple months, but uh, it was a great time to grow up watching sports. For you, how tall are you? Six foot two and a half. And so did you want just to be like Magic Johnson or did you want to be a post player and uh, dominate under the boards? No, I wanted to be just like him, like run the fast break, throw the no look passes. I thought he put on a great show. Um, I thought he could, you know, he saw the floor. I saw the floor in a lot of ways. I think most people don't realize I played point guard all my life until my sophomore junior year of college. So point guard was my position. I grew up playing it, thinking that way, and I wasn't even a shooter until uh, I got to really my senior year of high school was when I really fell in love with making jump shots. So I went through a lot of shooting issues and, and wasn't a great shooter, um, and I didn't really value it until I got to the point where I met one of my high school coaches who showed me a way to shoot that I thought was unique and helped me, and I use that same same foundation right now as I teach players how to shoot. So I was a point guard at, at heart, and I loved running the break and throwing the no-look pass. Pete Maravich, another amazing player who I, who I loved uh, watching and, and reading about. I read all his books as a kid. Uh, I realized, at, well, you know, if you read his stuff, you realize you got to practice a ton just to be really good. So um, I fell in love with practicing, um, and I wanted to throw no-look passes like magic. And then when I realized I needed to make a jump shot to, be, to get to the next level, I started to, to really work on that. When did you realize you were not the best player on the court? Um, well, I played varsity as a sophomore, and I realized then I wasn't a sophomore in high school. Um, you know, I think you're always evaluating yourself based on your competition as a player, at least I was. And um, I never felt like I was ever the, the best player on the court until my senior year uh, of high school. At that point, I felt like I was, I had reached that point. Um, and then my senior, my junior year of college, I felt like I was the best player on the court. I came a little earlier then, but at that level, it wasn't Division One. So, um, and then in the NBA, I never, I never felt like I was the best player in the NBA. In Europe, I did uh, when I played over there, but not, not in the NBA. And so, when they say that you are a NBA shooting coach, like. Can you believe it? What are you trying to tell these guys that just are phenomenal athletes and they can score, but sometimes their uh, form is just soft? How do, you, how do you reach those guys? Well, I can shoot better than them, so it starts with that. I mean, I became a shooter to where I would make a hard threes in a row and then I would leave. That would, that would be kind of my daily routine. So when you get good enough to become that, that good where you're making that many shots in a row, and I can still probably make, 88 to 92 out of 100 now um you know when players see me shoot they always say okay how you do that and um so that it, it becomes really easy um I, I started working with drew holiday by playing in a pickup game with him and i made eight threes so that was enough for him to go okay i need to work with you can you help me so he was one of my first clients about seven years ago so it started with guys like him who just literally want, said, show me how you do what you do. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're obviously great athletes, but the skill side of basketball takes thousands and thousands and thousands of hours to, to really master. Um, and a lot of times they're so good that they don't need to shoot. Um, I think in today's game you need to shoot to be, you know, better and to grow and to improve your value. So, uh, you know, my value's grown uh, throughout – around the league, and then now, obviously, with the Lakers. So, Jeff Perlman shares in the book, Three Ring Circus, about how you get to play Allen Iverson in a practice 
and how you lit up everybody that was trying to guard you. I want to hear from your vantage point. What, what was that experience like for you to say, you have the green light, go show them what it's going to be like to play against Iverson? Yeah, I mean, I felt like I was back in college. You know, that was my sport 28 game in college. So it was normal to, to have those kind of uh, performances on a regular basis. So getting the green light, look, every NBA player was a 28 point a game yeah. kid, you know. So uh, if you give any of those guys an opportunity to just go out and score every time, they're gonna they're gonna show you something special. So it was it was nice to be able to to take that role. Uh, I actually had a great time uh, doing it, and I think a lot of the players were surprised. Like, man, but the reality was that wasn't my role in the team or any team in the NBA because nobody was gonna let me shoot that much or be that kind of player. But in Europe, it was that role, and I did that. I scored over fifty a number of times, and had a couple of real big games over there. So scoring was a part of my life as a as a player. But it isn't always your role on the team. So you just got to take your job. My job was to space the floor with the Lakers. And then, obviously, when I got those chances to score, it was it was like going back and saying, hey, this is this feels like I'm back in college again. So I understand that you were a forklift driver for a little bit before you got picked up. Mm-hmm. Did you feel as though your dreams were over and you were just going to focus on a 9-to-5? Or did you know that you just had to wait till that next opportunity came? I just kept waiting for the opportunity. I mean, I, you never know in basketball when the opportunity is going to come. So I had, there were times when I was driving the fork with and I would get a call, phone call from my agent said, Hey, you need to work out today. The Philippines coaches are here. And I would leave work early and drive in the car over to Laguna and drive an hour and just work out for them, you know, right off the cuff. So you, you were basically on call waiting for somebody to say, Hey, we're going to take the opportunity to, to uh, to, to watch you. So um, I guess my dreams were always there, but I didn't ever think I was going to get a chance to play in the NBA. So I was really focused on just getting somewhere in Europe and then making my name known over there. Um, but it happened to be that, that uh, Tex Winter was watching me play before their game, and that, the rest was history after that. And I know one of those in-between stints, you played with athletes in action. I remember they beat, uh, I think it was Tubby Smith's Kentucky team, when people were just talking about that with that um, going on, what was that experience like for you? Did that help cement your faith that you could be like a Christian, but still be competitive and involve yourself in, in sports as well? Yeah, there have been a number of examples of players over the years. I mean, I think of Mike Singletary, who really had a big impact on me, who was a great Christian man. And uh, really, I felt like lived for God, um, but was also a ferocious warrior and competitor. So, um, you know, sports, they're games, you know, they're, they're not life. You know, I'm not going home to my family trying to, to rip them up, tear them. You know I mean? It's, it's, it's not life. It's, it's a game. So how you play a game isn't necessarily who you are as a person. I'd say that for sure amongst the NBA players and having coached two of the best, when it's time to throw the ball up, they're different people than they are when they step off the court and, off the court, they're great human beings and wonderful guys. And I just felt like I had to be the same way. Um, and on the court, between the lines, it was it was a game. And sometimes that game meant to trash talk. Sometimes that game meant to be physical and, and rough and tough. Sometimes that game meant to to, uh, to show some pizzazz and entertain. So, But that isn't, uh, you know, um, it's not a microcosm of life. It really just is a game. So that's how you, I've, I've always viewed it. And um, being intense and and tough and competitive um like i said that's it's not me at starbucks that's me on the basketball court so um but i do think it's you you can be a great christian and compete as hard as you can uh, on the court and and uh and do all different types of things be entertaining be tough be be a showtime player like i thought there was nothing wrong with magic and what he did i thought that was just a, a embodiment of a skill um my now my interpretation may be this is what God has given me. This is the blessing that I see from Him, and I've worked to make that talent that He's given me the best I can be. Um, so that's how I would see it. Um, and if it's a no-look pass or a three-point shot or uh, or a key block down the stretch, whatever that is, um, those things are all just talents God's given us, and, and it's our job to to be good stewards of them. And that's that's really how I saw it. That's so good. Hey, so being a part of the Los Angeles Lakers, uh, was this 
a dream come true or did you kind of want to spread your wings somewhere else or did you always have Lakers on your mind and heart? As far as coaching yeah. is concerned? Yeah, I mean, I was just hoping to coach in the NBA. I, I want to see if, if I could do it. Um, so Flip Saunders gave my first ch- my first opportunity uh, in Minnesota, and that was really just me seeing if this is what I wanted to do. I had a great business going with, with uh, coaching players privately. I had 12 players um, that I would coach every day in the summer, and then I would coach another you know, six of them would sign up with me to be their consultant during the year. So I had a great business going. Um, you know, a lot of the agents used to tell me all the time, like, you're not going to the NBA, you have your own team. So it was nice to, to be there, but I had kind of reached the pinnacle of that. So I, I, I couldn't go, I couldn't get any more players on that level. And, and seven of them were all-stars. So I was really at, at a high level at the, on that individual side. So I want to see if what it would be like to coach uh, on a team. And, and Flip Saunders gave me that opportunity. And I'm, I'm forever thankful for him because I've gone in love with it. And I met all, a lot of great friends who are still around the league from that time but that gave me my in um and then that that allowed for me to get opportunities with with new orleans uh and then new orleans gave me you know further uh, opportunities obviously with the lakers but i remember you know my relationship with frank vogel started when i was coaching paul george mm-hmm. and solomon hill and um he tried to hire me in indiana now i didn't know about that uh, until he told me when he was trying to hire me here in uh, in la so um but, you know, your name gets around the league and you start to develop a reputation of what you're doing. And, and um, again, I didn't know that was going to happen either. I just was trying to, again, fulfill what I felt like was my calling, which was to coach players on an individual level. And now it's become more coaching players on a team level. So a question for you. I'm about 5'10", and the three-point shot was a great equalizer. Now that everybody's shooting threes, I have no position anywhere except, like, I can inbound the ball or maybe I can set a screen, but I'm not rolling or popping because they're taking the shot. How do you think the three-point shot has helped uh, basketball overall, and how do you think it has or if it has hindered players at all? Well, it's probably – Probably both are true. Um, it's probably helped some and, and hindered some. I think um, there are some players in the league who would be great at just screening and rolling and be valuable for teams because rolling is is a form of penetration in the defense that is really underrated, I think, in today's game. And that allows it, you know, it forces the defense to have to guard the paint. Um, so there are many players in the league who I think should just be screening and rolling and learning how to finish around the rim and even play make as they roll to the basket. So, but they fall in love with the three point line. Um, so I think that's, um, you know, I think, I think players need to, you know, really evaluate that. I know that would be my encouragement to them would be say, what's, what's going to keep you on the floor as a player? Is it going to be that you make one three per game, or is it going to be that you roll 15, 20, 30 times to a game that, that actually forces the defense to have to guard you. So um, I do think um, the three-point line has helped other players as well stick around longer who, who maybe maybe would have retired a while back. Um, it's, it's helped players um, develop their skills. So I love that from that standpoint, that other players are trying to develop and work on their game. Uh, I do think a lot of guys take a lot of bad threes. Uh, just because you take a three doesn't mean it's a good shot. Uh, I think that's where analytics has kind of hurt the game. Um, I, don't, I don't think uh, any three is good. Uh, I don't think, you know, any three-point shot you get, like some people would say, oh, just, just take a three instead of taking two. I disagree with that. Um, but um, I do think three-point um, shot has, has has made the game fun and it's opened up the floor and it's allowed for a lot of players uh, to sustain, uh, to extend their, their, their time in the NBA because they developed that skill. And it used to be something that guys would develop over time. Um, and later in their careers, you know, they go, oh, this guy's kind of developed into a pick and pop player. Um, and uh, but now it's starting to be that they come into the league that way. So uh, I, th- I think it's great for the game. Um, as long as guys are taking good shots, I don't have a problem with people taking a lot of them. A lot of good threes is good. Good basketball. Well, I think uh, I remember Sam Perkins and then J.R. Reed at the end of their careers. I was a big Carolina fan growing up and just seeing how it developed so they could lengthen their tenure in the NBA. Hey, Mike, Mike Penberthy, assistant coach for the Lakers, uh, champion as a player and as a coach, NBA shooting coach. Man, you have so many titles behind your name. I'm uh, running out of things to say. So I would just ask, when you're a shooting coach and you notice something, 
does Coach Vogel or some of the other coaches, are they open to what you have to say, or do you just each stay within your own niche? Well, we don't really have niches uh, in, in our team. We're, we're assistant coaches, so, um, you know, Frank has, has given – he gives us responsibilities, obviously, that we want to – that we want to fulfill that he feels like is best for the team. But we have a say, I mean, I played in the league, so I have a say on what I think we should do on, on all aspects of the game, just the way Jason Kidd would, Phil Handy would, Lionel Holland. And we all respect each other. And, and uh, it's our job to con- convince coach that that's what we want to do. And, and um, he brings a lot of those, you know, decisions to the table. And then we have our opinions that we, we discuss. Miles Simon, another guy who's had success yeah. at the college level and then a couple of years as a pro. So, our staff was built for those type of discussions. And, and um, so we don't, we didn't really stay in it. We didn't really have niches um, per se, uh, but we had players that we worked with regularly. Um, and listen, everybody could go ask anybody a question. Obviously uh, players would come to me for shooting advice, um, but they didn't have to, like it wasn't mandated that, Oh, he has a problem with the shot. Go work with Mike. That wasn't it at all. Uh, you know, they, they, Play. These are professional guys. They have their big boys. And if they yeah. want to go practice with their high school coach, they should be able to do that. If that's going to help them shoot better. But uh, we didn't have any real niches on our team this year and our staff. And, um, and we all had to work uh, to, to, you know, to be able to propose and, and suggest our, our our thoughts on what we should do. And, and uh, Frank Vogel was just he's, he's honestly an amazing coach and manager of the staff. He did an amazing job. And I'm thankful that he trusts trust me in that regard. That's so good. And uh, Mike Penberthy, uh, a couple questions, then we'll get you out. The first question, um, Paul Shirley was mentioned in the book with uh, Three Ring Circus by Jeff Perlman. I'm actually get to interview him next week, so I'm excited about that. But he said of Kobe Bryant, extremely talented, but very immature when he first came in. Seeing Kobe grow up, but obviously with the recent tragedy, what are your thoughts on being able to have known Kobe in the way that you did? Well, I knew Kobe as a player when he was number eight, you know, when he was young. So um, I think every player who comes into the NBA, even today, you know, is immature at the beginning of his career. I mean, uh, there's there's a suspended adolescence, I think, with a lot of these guys. And uh, they don't have to go work on forklift or write a check or pay a bill, you know. And so life is uh, somewhat suspended. Reality is somewhat suspended in a lot of ways for these guys some of them their entire lives um, because of just the way that it's worked out for them. Um, so uh, I can understand what Paul was saying there. Like there are, I think there are a lot of players like that, not just Kobe, hmm. um, but Kobe was, uh, was super young. I mean, he came in at 17 yeah. and then he was, he was goal was to become Michael Jordan and be better than Michael Jordan. So that's a, an incredible <laughs> goal to set for yourself. And he, um, but he, but he was young. You know, and um, and he was caught in caught in a, a tough situation with Shaq. You know, trying to figure out who was the top dog, and um, you know, he responded with the only way he really know because these guys, like I said, like like Paul said, these guys are young and they're trying to figure out how to act. So uh, you grow up in the NBA. That isn't reality. You know, it's a, it's a it's a unique place to be in, and it's a special place, and they do a great job of taking care of everybody. But it is unique in that regard, and sometimes it takes a long time for guys to mature. Now, when I hugged Kobe in August, um, you know, when his daughter was practicing and I got to see him, Kobe was a different person. Yeah. You know, he was a, he was a loving father who cared about his daughter and who wanted to see her play great and said, you got to take a look at her shot for me. And, you know, he was so proud of her. So Kobe was a different person. Um, then, and, Rightfully so. He was 40 years old or, or around that, 38, whatever it was. So, um, you know, he, he was older and, and more mature and had seen life. Look, none of us want to be judged at who we were at 25. You know, I mean, none of us do. I don't want anybody to say, oh, yeah, Mike Kermit, he was this guy. Remember when he was 23 and he did this? I, geez, I'm in trouble. So, um, thankfully, that's not how it is in life. And uh, I, I don't judge Kobe based on where he was at when he was I played with him at 23 um, you know I, I judge him I, the, the last time I spoke with him I thought he was incredible I thought he really had a, a different outlook on life there was a peace about him he wasn't fighting for anything anymore he was just there to support his daughter and to help her 
and uh, so that was great to see. I, I was thrilled to see that because you know obviously you you want to you want to see somebody grow up and be become a great person, and that was all I walked away with. Like, man, I can't believe Kobe's changed that way. He like, he just seems so happy. Yeah, that even makes it more of a tragedy, but uh, it's awesome to hear. And uh, Mike, thanks for spending some time. Uh, a couple of fun questions. Simply, who was somebody at the end of the bench, no offense, but that you enjoyed hanging out with? Or were you constantly fighting for that last couple spots that you were more competitive and you didn't want to get close to the people? Yeah, uh, the way Phil Jackson set up that team, there was everybody was equal. So, uh, there. I mean, I played a lot of minutes for a guy who was – coming off the bench, you know, who's a rookie especially. So, um, you know, I was playing 15 minutes a game on average, but there were nights when I played 35 and there were nights when I played zero. So when my name was called, it was seen as valuable as Shaq and Kobe. And that was how Phil Jackson set up the culture. And I thought that was genius and had his part. Um, so we didn't really have any, uh, you know, any fights or arguments for, for playing time or spots on the floor. It was seen as your job. And if you played, you played. And if you didn't, you were still – were just as valuable because practices were just as important as the games. And so those guys that practiced and, and did those things were seen as just as valuable. Nobody treated you differently um, because you played more or less on that team. They were professional. Um, you know, some guys played a lot. You know, some there were nights when I played, Brian Shaw didn't. Um, and there were nights when I played more than Ron Harper. And then there were other nights when they, those guys obviously played more than me. So we didn't see it in that way. I had a great relationship with Ty Lue. Um, so we had we sat next to each other on the plane. Um, so uh, it it is it wasn't as competitive or dog eat dog with those guys. Um, we were trying to win a championship, and when you do that, you know it didn't really matter where you or how many minutes you play. That's Mike Penberthy. Make some time. Uh, you can follow him on Instagram, Mike Penberthy. With a three, Mike. Thank you so much for uh, staying with us. It's uh, certainly a pleasure having you on. Are we back? Yeah, you're back. You're back. So uh, it's so good to have you on and to be a part. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. I uh, hear you. I can't hear you for some reason. All right. Well, um, we'll just thank you and get you out and uh, make sure you guys get a book of Jeff, a uh, copy of Jeff Perlman's book, Three Ring Circus. Follow Mike on Instagram. Oh, no, and uh, we just say congratulations to Mike Penberthy. With that, I'm out. You are listening to Jay Fuller Interviews, Jay Fuller Interviews on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and the Backfire Podcast on Google Podcasts and iTunes. With that, we're out. Listen to people's stories because that'll make your story so much better. And then we have more coming up later. Paul Shirley, as I mentioned, and uh, some others. Go check out the past broadcasts I had.